wasn't so long ago that, yeah, you know, I mean, Mao killed somewhere on the order of 50 million people through starvation and political campaigns. I mean, China is capable of this kind of totalitarian behavior, and we've got to confront it. We've got to um, try to expose it for what it is, and we have to try to, you know, starve the beast, as it were, of the of the money and of the ideas and of the technology and even of the markets that it needs to to keep growing. My guest today is Mark Clifford. Mark is president of the Committee for Freedom in Hong Kong. His latest book, Today Hong Kong, Tomorrow the World, What China's Crackdown Reveals About Its Plans to End Freedom Everywhere, is causing big waves around the world. A resident of Hong Kong for close to 30 years, Mark gives us a gripping history of China's deteriorating relationship with Hong Kong and its implications for the rest of the world. I recently sat down with Mark and we talked about how a city once famed for protests so peaceful that toddlers joined grandparents at rallies, became a place where police have fired tear gas, rubber bullets, and even live ammunition at their neighbors. Mark, thanks for coming on the show. I greatly appreciate it. Well, thank you, Charles. A real pleasure to talk with you. Hey, Mark's latest book, Today Hong Kong, Tomorrow the World, really amazing read. What China's Crackdown Reveals About Its Plans to End Freedom Everywhere. And uh, Mark, I want to tell you this book is a bit chilling, to say the least. Well, my experience over the last couple of years uh, being on the sharp end of the Chinese stick as it's punished Hong Kong and the company I was involved with has been pretty chilling, too. And I think people should know about that. Yeah. So you speak from authority in the sense that you lived in Hong Kong for close to, what, 29, 30 years or so? Mm -hmm. And your position there was what? Well, uh, I did a number of things. I was the editor in chief of both of the English language newspapers. Uh, I ran a business association, a Pan Asia business association of CEOs. And I was on the board of Next Digital, on the board of directors of the company that published the um, the pro democracy newspaper known as Apple Daily, which uh, was shut down by the government in an extraordinary uh, turn of events. Uh, we have seven people in jail right now, as you and I talk, Charles. And um, even if uh, people are listening to this uh, a bit later, it's uh, pretty unlikely they're getting out of jail anytime soon. Most of them are being held without bail, no trial, of course, uh, and uh, essentially judged guilty on this vague and sweeping national security law that has chilled Hong Kong. Okay, let's set the stage. Uh, for what, where we are today and where we were prior to 2019 or so when, when uh, China decided to uh, renege or not honor their agreement uh, that they made back, what was it, 19, I think 1980? They, they made the agreement in the 80s, 80s, but the key moment was 1997 when Britain gave back Hong Kong to China. Right. It had been a colony for 150 years. Right. I think it was 84. Or if I'm not mistaken, in mm -hmm. 84, mm -hmm. I do remember, I remember hearing that, that China was, uh, Hong Kong was going to be uh, uh, given back to the Chinese by the British, and it was supposed to take place in 1997, I believe, the handoff. And mm -hmm. at the time, Hong Kong was, well, I'm not going to even say do it any justice. What was Hong Kong? Hong Kong was one of the freest, most open uh, places in the world, certainly economically. It was a kind of anything goes, wild, wild east sort of environment. It was on the edge of China, but uh, benefited from British uh, rule of law, administration, justice, and above all, civil liberty, free speech, free worship, freedom of assembly, all the freedoms that you and I would take for granted here in the States. Right. I, I was in Hong Kong in 2016. And it was such a happening place. It was uh, so cosmopolitan. I remember uh, in the hotel uh, upstairs where I, uh, we, we had drinks, there were people from Germany, there were people from France, there were people from all parts of the world sitting down together. We were just uh, sharing a drink and uh, looking out the window at the harbor, you saw boats going to uh, America and all sorts, of, everywhere goods were being produced in China and sent out. It was, you were literally at the focal point of capitalism, of freedom. It was like, I wouldn't say idyllic, but you couldn't pick a better place on earth in terms of having such a beautiful mix of, of, of vibrancy, of 
freedom and of capitalism. Am I sizing that up? You lived there 30 years. I did. It was pretty idyllic. And uh, you've uh, you mentioned the harbor and sitting up in a building. Obviously, you know, there's seven and a half million people crammed into an area. The buildable area is smaller, much smaller than New York and uh, overlooking the um, this extraordinary harbor, series of islands, steep mountains, uh, up to 3000 foot peaks. So it's a kind of mixture of San Francisco and Manhattan, but with this, you know, perhaps the most cosmopolitan place on earth, as you say, people from everywhere. And it really was, it wasn't just East meets West, it was East meets West meets North meets South. And uh, because it was the free place on the edge of China, it's where a lot of uh, money, ideas, goods, uh, transited to and from China. It was like nowhere else on, on earth. And um, I think it also, because it represented freedom, um, it was seen as a, as a sort of challenge to China. So when China takes over 1997, they make a statement that it's going to be, uh, it's going to be remain what it is, right? It was two systems what was the uh, one country, one country, two systems, one country, the two Chinese systems. system in the mainland and the kind of capitalist British style system in Hong Kong. Right. OK, so you had this agreement that it was really a carve out uh, here. You had such democracy throughout all the years and, and a, a thriving business community and the people were just wonderful. Just, uh, you know, I remember uh, we, we flew in and uh, I was never there. So um, uh, the the black. Uh, cabs with the steering wheel on the wrong side of the road, like for us right, Americans. Right. And, and it had like uh, such a taste of, of England and yet it had its own unique flavor. And the person I was with uh, lived in Hong Kong and he kept telling me, see that, uh, that was a fishing village 50, 60 years ago. My parents own that. And to look at what Hong Kong is, you can't visualize what it was. Yeah, I just just one clarification. It was free, but there wasn't democracy. And I think this was the problem. The Brits held off until very, very late. It was the last governor, Chris Patton, who tried to introduce more democracy. Part of the, the slowness was the British colonial establishment. But people forget much of that was China. Every time Britain tried to introduce more democracy, China told it to back off. And China was always very threatening and didn't want democracy. But promised after 1997 that uh, the people of Hong Kong would be able to have universal suffrage, which it's not a country, right? It's a city. So what that meant in practice is that someday under the Chinese, Hong Kong people were supposed to be able to elect their mayor and their city council. We call it the chief executive and the legislative council. But I mean, really, that's what this whole thing was about. The right to elect the mayor and the city council and to be free, not to have to worry about the midnight knock at the door from the the jack boots. Okay. So now the economy is doing great. People are doing great. It's a, it's a, it's a real amazing happening place. Cosmopolitan, all of that comes to a crashing halt. And when, do, uh, let me ask you, when do you start seeing the change? Well, it go, immediately after 1997, it was clear that, uh, you know, look, they're communists, you know, they can't help it. They'd killed their own people in 1980. And I shouldn't laugh. I mean, but yeah, you know, they killed their own students in 1989 in the Tiananmen massacre, and and they they almost immediately started trying to introduce national security legislation uh, in Hong Kong. Which you know, fair enough. Every country's got national security legislation. The laws were outdated, um, but uh, people and and this was in the mini constitution. But Hong Kong people didn't trust the Chinese communist Chinese to do the right thing. And about a half a million people came out in the streets in 2003. And I think this really shocked the Chinese. They seem to have this naive idea that after the handover from the British, the newly liberated Hong Kong people would be so grateful to the leadership in Beijing for having, you know, removed the yoke of colonialism, that they were just going to embrace everything Chinese, communist or not. And obviously the people in Hong Kong who are used to freedom, if they didn't have democracy, they had freedom. They weren't going to, they weren't going to take that line down. And so you had a half a million people come out in the streets in 2003 and had a series of demonstrations as, over the years as, and it became 
you know, demonstrating and protesting became part of the Hong Kong culture. But things really came to, you know, more of a climax over the last decade. Uh, first, we had the so-called umbrella movement of 2014, when um, students uh, took to the streets and basically had a, a sit-in in downtown Hong Kong for 79 days. Um, interestingly, the government just refused to negotiate. And, you know, we were sort of stalemated for a few years. And then in 2019, um, the, that's when things really hit the fan. And by the way, prior to, to 2019, these demonstrations, there were no, from what I know of, and you tell me otherwise, there were no rubber bullets or tear gas or any way to disperse the crowd. Uh, parents would bring their small children in carriages, baby carriages, and it was peaceful. It was like a mutual respect. It was a um, the rights of the people to, or so they thought, to demonstrate, and nothing much of it in terms of you didn't have to worry about your security or, or risk being arrested. Is that more or less accurate? Ab absolutely. I mean, uh, the demonstrations in Hong Kong were among the most peaceful anywhere in the world, and it, it was everybody from you know eight weeks old to eighty eight years old, probably older. I mean, you know, everybody came out. It was a family affair. And, uh, you know, which isn't surprising because in every single free election that Hong Kong's had, starting in 1991 and ending in 2019, roughly six out of 10 people always voted for the pro-democracy candidates. I mean, it's very clear, Hong Kong people wanted democracy. And so this wasn't some sort of fringe uh, movement. And you saw that in, in the streets and never a window broken. I mean, you know, basically no litter left. I mean extraordinarily peaceful. That started to change in 2014. That's at the beginning of the umbrella movement. Uh, the the firing of a lot of police tear gas actually sparked a lot of anger. And I think, you know, really set the pattern for um, the police going from regarded, they're, they're often called Asia's finest, to now, you know, among the most hated group in Hong Kong. I mean, you know, it's just, it's, it's really sad because the police used to be seen as protectors. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as you say, they were just helping people exercise their right to demonstrate and no more. Why was it called the umbrella protest? Um, because as the first uh, 87 rounds of tear gas were fired late in September 2014, uh, some people put up uh, umbrellas, if you can imagine, to try to protect themselves from the tear gas. Not very effective, but it did make a good photo. And uh, one of those was a yellow umbrella of a lone protester sort of vainly holding up his umbrella as the clouds of tear gas envelop him uh, was a, a picture that went around the world. And it... it um, just became called the umbrella movement. And that sort of showed you, I mean, these were not violent people. They were coming to the demonstration with umbrellas, right? And not much of a protection as it turned out against uh, water cannons and uh, pepper spray and, and rubber bullets and sometimes live bullets. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now let's fast forward to 2019. Everything changes. Uh, but first we go to 2019, did anyone think that the mighty dragon was gonna let Hong Kong exist the way it did for close to what, 60, 70 years? Did anyone think that was going to be possible? Well, you know, in retrospect, it's always easy to say, oh, how could, you know, how could you possibly think that the, as you say, the dragon, the, the communist Chinese would really allow democracy? Um, how, you know, okay, they signed an international treaty with the, with the British in 1984, as you mentioned. They had a mini constitution for the Hong Kong people, you know, a great, filled with great promises, but who, who could possibly believe them? Well, I think that China of the 1980s and the 1990s was a more hopeful time. It was a time when China was continuing to open. It was growing, of course, very rapidly economically. Um, and it was about it was trying to get into the World Trade Organization, trying to get the Olympics, the first of the Olympics, um, 2008 Olympics, which were um, awarded a few years after the 1997 handover. And I think, you know, people wanted to believe, right? I mean, people even believe that Hong Kong might kind of set the pattern for China. And, and Jiang Zemin, who was the president of China in the 1990s, uh, famously said, um, it's the uh, title of one of the chapters in my book, river water does not mix with well water. And what he meant was, uh, Hong Kong shouldn't mix with the mainland because Hong Kong might uh, infect the mainland with the purity of its water, I would say, with its democratic uh, and its, its its principles of freedom. So, 
you know, things were a lot more in flux in China than they are now. And it wasn't clear what road that they would go down this this totalitarian road. So just a history a lesson for a second for me. In 1898, they get the lease. Uh, England gets the uh, you, yeah, Britain gets the yep. lease on Hong Kong. The only time they're under occupation is the Japanese during World War II, right? So, yep. so from 1898 to 1941, uh, it's a British colony, and then from 1945 to 2019, it re, uh, till, till I'm sorry, till 1997, it remains a British colony, and then turned up. So these. Yeah, okay. Yeah, a little more history. Actually, Britain took over uh, Hong Kong Island itself in 1841 in the first Opium War. It then got a, another chunk of territory in 1860 in the second Opium War. And it got that third part. You And those were both supposed to be forever in perpetuity. And then in 1898, it got this bit of land that had the 99 year lease. And thus uh, that set the way for, for the handover. Um, so it was actually 156 years of British rules, a long time. Right. And uh, punctuated with that, um, the only British, def- the first British defeat since um, uh, in the American Revolution, uh, when the Japanese came in in, in um, 1941. So, uh, yeah, it was a long time to be under a British colony, and while every, everywhere else in the in the world, people were throwing off their colonial yokes, getting rid of their colonial masters, and becoming independent, that was never an option for Hong Kong. And so, Hong Kong had about another fifty years of colonialism, forty fifty years of colonialism, after most um, most other Asian countries had had gotten their independence. So it was this kind of weird, long colonial twilight where they were able to develop without having to worry about a lot of things because the British were protecting them. And so they, you know, as I said, developed a very, very robust and, and open and free civil society, particularly uh, in the last um, 10 or 15 years of British rule. Yeah, I remember like uh, maybe 20 years ago uh, when uh, when the the first, the I think it was uh, 02 when you mentioned that they had the protests. The point was, I remember the, the thinking at the time and speaking to people at the time that uh, Hong Kong would never, you know, kill the goose that laid the golden egg. There's too much money there. There's there's too much vibrancy. The world wouldn't stand for it. Uh, it's thriving. It's making, uh, you know, uh, money. And why would China ever do something to destroy that? Well, now we've got a totalitarian leader, Xi Jinping, who <coughs> wants... Uh, wants wants it both ways. He wants the vibrancy and the creativity and the innovation of of a you know kind of new economy, and uh, at the same time he wants absolute control. And I think this is obviously a major problem for Hong Kong, but it's a really big problem for China as well because the um, kind of growth ambitions they have uh, depend, I believe, on a more open society and a freer flow of information and. Uh, I'm already hearing that people are in China. I mean, they might not like the COVID restrictions, but they're particularly the elite are increasingly concerned that they're being cut off from the flow of people, the flow of ideas, the flow of knowledge, mm-hmm. the flow of technology. So Hong Kong, in a way, is is the kind of canary in the coal mine where we see not only how China wants to behave when it can in the rest of the world, but we also see that the costs and the the, the damage that Hong Kong is enduring uh, is, I believe, going to, to start uh, spreading to the mainland more broadly. Okay. So now in 2019, everything changes, right? And you had a, you were upfront and personal with this one. So yeah. your book yeah. does a great job. In the first chapter, I believe, you really suck the reader in where you're actually walking through the streets and uh, the summer of democracy, I think that's yeah, the well water. Yeah, river water does not mix well with uh, well water. And you're walking through the streets with you and your things are not good, right? It's June 4th, 2019, 30th anniversary of the killings near Tiananmen Square. And I'm going to let you set the stage. Yeah. So every year on June 4th, there there had been a demonstration to or a, a vigil, actually, not a demonstration, a vigil at uh, Victoria Park and named after Queen Victoria, the, the British queen who, who was reigning when Hong Kong was taken. And you know, sometimes there'd be a few thousand people. Sometimes there'd be a few tens of thousands of people. And this year in 2019, there were about 150,000 people. It was just packed. But again, very peaceful families. Um, and I remember in the subway on the way home, I saw uh, a man with a, a young son 
Um, and the son was watching the tank man video, the Tiananmen video where the lone protester stands in front of a tank, stops the tank from, from going down Tiananmen Square or Tiananmen Boulevard, Ch Changnan Boulevard right after the killings. Mm -hmm. And I, I said, and the kid's about six years old. He's still wearing his schoolboy uh, uniform, white shorts, white shirt. And I said, hey, what, you know, what's going on? And the guy who was in his mid to late thirties said, we can't forget our history. We have to remember our history. And I thought, wow, these guys have just lost another generation. The, the, the father was probably in his mid to late thirties. So uh, he would have been about his son's age at the time of the actual Tiananmen killings. And here we are literally a generation later and a six year old schoolboy is watching a tank man video to learn how his government, the bosses up in Beijing run things. And if it means running over a protester, uh, that guy in the video was not run over, but if it does, they'll do that. And on the other hand, the kid was learning, you can stand, you can stand up to these people, you can protest, and he, they just come from the Tiananmen vigil. So things, that was an interesting sign for me because it showed, you know, tensions were really running high because a new bill had been introduced which would allow um, the river water to mix with the well water, as it were, uh, and allow extradition from Hong Kong to China. And although they're part of the same country, there's a hard border control. It's harder to go from Hong Kong to uh, China than it is from the United States to Canada. Um, and I mean, it's you know, Hong Kong has its own currency, its own tax system, its own government. I mean, it's really its own laws. And the idea that somebody could be extradited, extradited into the so-called judicial system in China was just too much for Hong Kong people. And it was too much for a lot of business people because most Hong Kong business people have done business in the mainland. Business in the mainland is opaque and really relies on bureaucratic discretion, which means it's an invitation to bribery and corruption. Hong Kong businessmen did not want the threat of being extradited into China because they made somebody mad, even if they hadn't done anything illegal. So there was a lot of uh, business support quietly in the form of money. And there were, um, that night, there were 150,000 people on the street. The, the following Sunday, uh, I guess June 9th, uh, when there was the first big rally against this extradition bill, there were a million people on the street a million people in a city of seven and a half million people and, a, and one that could not draw on a hinterland. There were not people from mainland China coming in any numbers coming to these demonstrations. And uh, the following weekend, the government said they would shelve the bill. And still the next day, two million people came out. Can you imagine two million people from a city of seven and a half million? It's sort of like 80 million Americans descending on Washington mm. proportionally. So the government realized it was in deep, trouble. And rather than in a, a kind of open society, the government would fall, somebody else would get elected, you'd have a new prime minister, you'd have a new government, or and or the government would negotiate. I mean, generally, when most people don't like what you're doing in your government, you negotiate, right? And, and again, remember, this is about pretty minor stuff, an extradition bill here, electing the mayor and the city council there. But what did Hong Kong do? It doubled down and uh, the police violence escalated dramatically. And in fact, in the week between the demonstration of the million people and the demonstration of two million people, the police had been particularly vero ferocious and brutal. And actually, um, a report by a human rights group uh, later came out called How Not to Police a Protest. I mean, it was just appalling the way the police were, were these responded. Hong, but, let me interject for a second. Were these Hong Kong policemen? Well, that's a great question. Yes, they were Hong Kong policemen. Um, it, there may have been some mainlanders. You know, my understanding now is there are a lot of mainlanders in, in the in the in the force, and that certainly seems when you look at how they walk, you know, their physique and things. Um, and I think more important, Charles, and this is interesting to me at least, um, the senior Hong Kong police uh, had in many cases been groomed in the mainland for decades, been going to mainland police. Uh, they've been seconded there. They've been training there. They, I think, you know, the, interestingly, the Communist Party is an underground party in Hong Kong, so we don't actually know who's a member, but I, I'm pretty sure they've been ideologically indoctrinated, if not inducted into the party. So uh, although they were Hong Kong police, they weren't really Hong Kongers anymore. I mean, I think they had been mainlandized, we would say, by, you know, the Communist Party in mainland China. But it was like a whole different world from what we'd seen before. And I saw it on the streets. It used to be you could talk to the police, as you said, they were very friendly and they would, they would, you know, they basically seemed like they were out there to 
help ensure that everybody was safe and healthy and happy before they protested and, and went home. No more. They wouldn't talk to you. They wouldn't meet your eye. And this, I first noticed this in, in June at that demonstration in June 2019. So when do the wheels come off the car? When does this start escalating? When do we start seeing the violence? What precipitates that? Well, I think the fact that the police were so heavy handed just enraged ordinary Hong Kongers. And for the first time that summer, uh, 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 significant numbers of Hong Kongers in opinion polls said that they uh, believed that violence was necessary in some cases to affect political change. I mean, again, this was like one of the most peaceful, law-abiding, you know, crime-free practically places in the world. Mm. But I think it was the government response. But where the where I think the wheels really came off, uh, and the pro Beijing people would have a different answer, which I could probably also give you. Um, I think it, it they came off on, uh, I think it was July 27th, late July, in a kind of kind of remote, it was one of the satellite towns that was, you know, like your friends said, you know, it was a fishing village 50 or 60 years ago, built these huge towns to um, house people. And uh, uh, a group of thugs, um, they're called triads, uh, they run a lot of the organized crime and probably most of the organized crime in Hong Kong. They often work closely with the police, or they have historically. And they attacked a group of innocent people who were getting off the subway at the end of the subway line. And some of them have been coming from demonstrations and some of them were just coming from work. I mean, they beat a pregnant woman. I mean, the scenes are just appalling. Everybody knew for hours ahead that something was gonna happen uh, in Yunlong, the town that day. Uh, the police somehow were nowhere to be seen. This is a place where you call the police are everywhere, very well policed. Police sort of show up a half an hour later local pro Beijing legislator shows up and is sort of joking with the guys who've been doing the beating and seems to be congratulating them on video. You know, there's been, there's no accounting for that. And in fact, a journalist who tracked down, used uh, public information to track down some of the license plates involved was herself prosecuted and put in jail. But um, actually, I'm not sure she was jailed, prosecuted and convicted. Uh, so, you know, I would say that Yunlong attack where you have Seemingly, the government and organized crime in a mob attack to beat civilians and then cover it up, I would say, was a, a you know significant turning point. There were others as well. There was something a month later where the police, and again, this is all on video, much of it captured by the brave journalists of Apple Daily and some of the other pro-democracy publications in Hong Kong. The, the police just stormed into these subway cars and just started beating the holy crap out of people. I mean, it's unbelievable footage. It looks like, you know, a moraining group of gangs, of thugs, of, you know, something you'd see from some kind of third world horror movie. This is happening in Hong Kong. And it's a small city, a lot of communication. A lot of this was live streamed and photographed. And you know, people are like, our own government is like, is beating us. I was beating our kids. And so what happens next? Well, it just, interestingly, there were a series of events in, increasingly violent and uh, you know, the city came close to a standstill. Uh, there was you know, a, a, a siege of one of the universities um, and the kids are using like slingshots and bow and arrows, you know, and flaming bow and arrows, you know, all sorts of crazy things with Molotov cocktails, not nice, you know? And the, but again, the government was not negotiating at all. The siege ended, I mean, quite a few people were arrested. Uh, amazingly, almost no one was killed throughout all this violence. There was uh, someone who, who was killed by a rock thrown by demonstrators, tragically, horribly, uh, and a number of suicides and, and some unexplained deaths. But uh, anyway, it was it was more um, property damage than, than anything else. But interestingly, on November 19th, so you know, after about five months of intense and ever escalating demonstrations, some elections were held, district council elections, like the ward. It's one level down from the city council. It's like a ward politician. And the, of course, the Beijing people thought uh, with all this violence, Hong Kong's conservative, you know, there's a kind there's a silent majority of pro Beijing people. The pro Democrats, again, got six out of 10 votes. They swept the elections. The turnout was incredibly high. This actually gave them political power of a sort at the district, you know, the grassroots level they'd never had before, but also gave them a lot of say in electing the next chief executive. You know, I think this just stunned Beijing. And so instead of Beijing, so anyway, what stopped the violence 
were elections. I mean, isn't that what democracy is about? You know, I don't want to be fighting. If you and I disagree, I don't want to be fighting you out in the studio or on the streets or something. We'll have a vote. We'll we'll have competition of ideas, you know, better in, in uh, theory sometimes than in practice, but it's still better than fighting people in the streets. So the elections, I think, were a really important kind of circuit breaker in this. But again, rather than Beijing and the chief executive of Hong Kong, Carrie Lam, saying, okay, you made your point. We've had this horrible summer. We've had these demonstrations. Some people have died. A lot of people have been hurt. 10,000 plus have been arrested. Um, you know, maybe we should sort of listen to what the people, and now the people have voted. And it's very, very clear, you know, what they want. But instead of doing that, Beijing just doubled down. They sent a couple of hardline guys down to, to take over the key uh, government posts, you know, the key Chinese government posts. And these guys, I mean, one of them made his made his career busting up churches, Christian churches in, the, in an interior province of Zhejiang. This is a guy who literally was a crossbreaker. You send him down to Hong Kong. The other guy was a similarly, you know, kind of hardline Communist Party apparatchik. And you, you send people like that down to Hong Kong. Well, guess you're going to get more hardline tactics. And um, six months later, we had a national security law, which, um, uh, you know, is the reason my colleagues are in jail right now. Who's actually in jail? Who are the seven people in jail? Well, the, the most notable, of course, is Jimmy Lai, um, who was the founder of, of Apple Daily. I mean, remarkable story. Um, I'll tell you about the, a little bit about the other six, but let me spend a few minutes, if I can, on, on Jimmy. Um, he uh, came to Hong Kong as an illegal immigrant at the age of 12, uh, smuggled in on the floor of a small fishing boat, uh, came over, you know, first he went into Macau and then across the Pearl River Delta. He was a child laborer. He lived in a, in a, a textile factory, taught himself English by reading the dictionary, doesn't have anything more than I think a fifth grade education, but he was one of these great Hong Kong success stories. He ended up uh, doing well enough that he actually became uh, an owner of a textile factory. And from there, he went on to, um, to fast fashion. He founded a retail chain called Giordano, which is sort of like Uniqlo or H&M, you know, before its time of the, of the 80s, publicly traded company. Yeah, he was a Hong Kong guy. Hong Kong had been great to him, you know, came there as a kid. Um, it, it, it made him. And then the events of June 1989, when the Chinese killed so many students and pro-democracy demonstrators in, in Beijing radicalized him. And he, he said, OK, um, I'm going to start a magazine. And pretty quickly, his next magazine became the number two magazine in, in Hong Kong, kind of mixture of uh, paparazzi, celebrity, um, gossip, and, and real pro-democracy bent. And, but he's a very, very outspoken guy. Uh, and in 1993, he, so four years after the Tiananmen killings, he penned a, an editorial column uh, attacking um, Li Peng, the premier of China, as the, the butcher of Beijing. And the Chinese government just reacted with absolute fury. And they started finding all sorts of reasons to harass his clothing business um, for the stores they had in the mainland. The mainland was just opening up. Everybody wanted to get to the mainland to get rich with their business. And um, eventually, Jimmy had to choose. Do I go with this fledgling little magazine? Um, or do I stick with this publicly traded company? I've got shares in it worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And he did what almost nobody else ever does against the Chinese. He said, forget it. I don't care about my business interest. Uh, I'll, and he just sold the shares, got out of business. And he was basically untouchable by the Chinese in, in his media business in Hong Kong. Then he doubled down and opened the newspaper, Apple Daily. Um, which has nothing to do with the Apple, Apple computer. He's, he's, uh, he's a Christian, actually a Catholic. And, and he said, uh, well, Eve ate the apple and without, without and that was knowledge and without, without the apple, there would be no news. So let's call it Apple news. So mm -hmm. um, uh, he, and then he did the same thing in Taiwan, which he um, uh, mistakenly thought was going to sort of pave the way to democracy in the mainland. Um, so he became a really successful publisher, but he, he just irked the Chinese too much because he was so pro-democracy. And the first time I met him was 1993 and before he had started the newspaper and he was explaining why he'd do it. And he said, look, 1997 is coming. All the other media owners are running scared. They're not gonna, they're not gonna give the Hong Kong people, the Hong Kong consumer, what she or he wants. I'm gonna open up a newspaper, gives them what they want. 
And uh, he did. And uh, that was that was too much of a challenge for for the authorities. But for 26 years, he published. And for that, um, yeah, he's in jail. And Wait, so, the you, so, so you work you work for Next Media. That's how he was. I calling. was on the board of directors. I was an independent um, member of the independent non-executive director. So I was not running day to day operations. I wasn't in the newsroom. I was um, actually in there to help uh, the transition from from print to digital, which we were. Well, by the time we were closed, we had 600,000 uh, paying digital subscribers in a city of seven and a half million people. So we were pretty proud of that. Um, but uh, yeah, the government came in and um, froze our bank accounts and uh, carded Jimmy was already in jail. Wait, so wait, let me just get the timeline on this. So yep. this is happening in August. This is less than, yeah, let's see. This, the second, <laughs> the first raid was August uh, 2020, right after the national security law came in. Uh, Jimmy ended up being denied bail and put in jail a year ago, December, um, and then last June. So, you know, just, you know, about eight months ago, uh, 550 armed police came in and uh, took away the C CEO, the editor in chief. And by the time they'd rounded up uh, some editorial writers, including one guy, they, they stopped at the airport, was on his way to London. There were seven of them in jail. Mm. So right now, it's the Apple Daily Seven. And other than Jimmy, who's been convicted on some pretty bogus charges, I would say, like lighting a candle, um, uh, nobody else is, has uh, been tried, let alone convicted, but they're being held indefinitely under this, this vague and sweeping national security law uh, legislation. I think their crime really seems to be that they believed in democracy and they had they had you know reached out to supporters in the rest of the world. So right, and Jimmy's a, not a young kid. He's a seventy four year old man, and he's in jail and was languishing there, and that's where he's going to be staying. Seems like for the foreseeable future. Yep. Unless you can do and, something uh, about so, that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's a seventy four year old diabetic, uh, um, devout Roman Catholic. Um, I think sustained by his faith, uh, always preached nonviolence, and yet. Every time they produce him for one of uh, the court appearances, they put about 35 pounds of shackles on him and, you know, try to, you know, if they make him shuffle around and try to humiliate him. And it's, uh, you know, again, going back to something you said at the beginning, Charles, you know, for for a long time, Hong Kong had been this free and open place. So you think about it, Jimmy and his colleagues have been doing the same thing for 26 years right. and it was fine. And then one day it wasn't fine. You know, I, I, just, and, I just want to interrupt you a second. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Mark. I think this is really important uh, for, for listeners to know is we're talking about, and, and I didn't know a lot of this till, till I started doing research for the show that Hong Kong is the world's 10th largest exporter and ninth largest importer. Uh, major capitalist service economy characterized by low taxation and free trade. And the Hong Kong dollar is the eighth most traded currency in the world. There's an island of piece of this much of <laughs> 7 million people. It's the home of the third highest number of billionaires of any city in the world. Must be something in the water, huh? Uh, the second highest number of billionaires of any city in Asia. And the largest concentration of ultra high net worth individuals of any city in the world. Uh, although the world, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, the city has one of the highest per capita incomes in the world. And this is this little tiny place where they've been doing this for the past 70 some odd years. Uh, Jimmy and his crew were doing nothing exceptional, or so they thought, until it, it became something. Yeah, thanks, Charles. I mean, I think those are really important uh, numbers. It's, it's, you know, this concentration of entrepreneurial energy and, you know, capitalist kind of spirits, um, uh, I, I think, needs freedom to survive. And uh, it'll be interesting because I think, you know, there still are a lot of billionaires and rich people there. And, you know, they also like stability and predictability, but it'll be interesting for them to be in a place where you don't have free flow of information anymore. And so I think we'll, we'll see how far uh, Hong Kong gets, but yeah, I mean, Jimmy and those guys were just doing what they've been doing for 26 years. I don't think we've ever city seen a free prosperous modern city. That's basically just been seen its freedoms uh, destroyed yeah. overnight. I mean, even, even Stalin took advantage of a post-war period where Soviet troops were already in Eastern Europe before he took over. Right. I mean, 
What was the reason for China doing okay. this? Okay, so so let me let me just add two more things before I ask a question because I think this is just fascinating. The city has the high the largest number of skyscrapers of any city in the world, and its residents have some of the highest life expectancies in the world. The dense space has led to a highly developed transportation network with public transport rates exceeding 90%. Hong Kong is ranked fourth in the Global Financial Centers Index. Amazing. Okay. Now, during this time, I do remember seeing a uh, statue or some type of figure of, of, uh, of the Statue of Liberty at one of the protests. Mm. And I do recall, I don't remember if it was the end of last year, where the Hong Kong people were asking the United States for help. Is, am I getting that right or am I? Yeah, yeah, no, I think um, actually Hong Kong and Taiwan are probably two of the only uh, places in the world that would have, if, if they could have voted in the US election, I, I don't know if they're two of the only, but Hong Kong would have overwhelmingly voted for Donald Trump uh, in the 2020 election. Uh, and I think that they they felt that the Trump administration saw more clearly than uh, its predecessors the the clear and present danger that China faces. And uh, you, know, you had uh, demonstrations with you know, dozens or scores of U.S. flags. Um, you you had important legislation going through the U.S. Congress in late 2019. Um, so yeah, I mean uh, Hong Kongers really looked, and I think to some degree still do look to the U.S. Um, to, to try to um, protect them. I think the U.S.'s options and power have shown to be less than the Hong Kong people would have liked, but um, I don't think that game's over yet either. Okay, so so here we are. Uh, recently had the Olympics in China for the whole world to see. Uh, Nancy Pelosi uh, said at the time that... Uh, that athletes should not speak out against the Chinese government, uh, even though there are 5 million Uyghurs in in prison in concentration camps. Uh, Hong Kong has been trampled upon. Uh, Innocent people are in jail. Go on and go on. Go on on from there. And uh, America is doing, well, let me rephrase. What is the world doing to turn the tide? Or are they doing anything? Yeah, uh, I think that's a great question, Charles. And um, I think we're now in a stage where we've seen some initial legislation, some initial sanctions, uh, particularly against senior officials in China and in Hong Kong who are involved with the atrocities against the Uyghurs, which, by the way, um, I think at any given time, they're probably closer to, let's say, we don't really know, but let's say closer to a million uh, Uyghurs in internment camps. Whatever the exact number is, this is the even one would be too many, of course. This is the largest internment we've seen since the Nazi period, yeah. right? I mean, you know, the Hong Kong stuff we can see a little more clearly because there's more media. Hong Kong, for those reasons you just you just elaborated on, is you know very connected to the rest of the world, at least for now. But you know, the Uyghurs are living in this very remote western area of China and just subjected to these horrific prison conditions. And they're not even formally considered prisoners. They just can't leave and they're locked up, uh, raped, tortured, I mean, in all in an attempt to try to exterminate their, their culture, their way of life. And I think the world is just coming to grips with that. There are a lot of people who are in denial still. They don't think it's that bad, or they say, what do you expect? They're communist or Chinese, or they still want to believe there's some reform going on. Or, and I think this is where America is really going to have to start confronting some issues. Or, uh, their businesses who think the China market or the China production is too important for them not to be there and engage on China's terms. And I think as Americans, we really have to start thinking whether or not we want, you know, pension funds from healthcare workers, ambulance drivers, uh, firemen, police women. Do we want that money going into China, going to embolden? the military capabilities of, of a country, which has basically said it's going to confront us and hopefully dislodge us. Yeah, but Mark, we're, I, we're in a situation here where just, as you know, uh, Intel put out a memo that uh, about suppliers, about uh, getting, uh, getting um, sourcing their, um, their uh, inventory, their goods from the area where the Uyghurs are from, and they had to walk that back. Uh, other right. major corporations had to walk back any derog- any any 
I shouldn't say derogatory because these weren't derogatory, anything dealing with human rights for people under uh, Chinese, uh, Ch Chinese control, they had to walk back. So if here you have major corporations, forget about pension funds and investing there. Here, the supply lines are so delicate, as we've seen through COVID, uh, how much of our pharmaceuticals are made in mainland China, uh, how much of everything, everyday items, <laughs> you know, book printing, uh, electronics are made in China, that uh, these kind of atrocities are being overlooked. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, I just, I think that, you know, I think we need to make uh, not only your listeners who are probably very well-educated people who know much of this, but I think Americans at large realize, to realize, you know, where the stuff is coming from and the kinds of compromises that companies have made. Uh, you, you know, I'm thinking of Daryl Morey from the Houston Rockets who, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. who tweeted, you know, a very innocent statement, stand with Hong Kong, you know, kind of general expression of support for democracy and freedom cost the NBA billions of dollars, probably cost more his job. And um, uh, here we are, you know, the NBA, which can stand for Black Lives Matter and all sorts of great uh, issues domestically, doesn't want to stand up to China. Well, I think we've got to start standing up to China or China's just going to, you know, flatten us. You know, when it comes to principles, I remember my father used to say this, when it's the principles or the money, right? It's always the money. It's never the principles. Everyone likes to say it's the principle of the matter. Now, when big money's involved, it's always the money. <laughs> and we're seeing, it's unfortunately, you know, that's the way of the world. And we're seeing this here. What I find so amazing is that, um, you know, uh, having lost uh, my grandmother's family uh, to, in the Holocaust to the Nazis, how could the world sit back, and not sit back, but participate in the 1936 Berlin Olympics, where Jews were not allowed to participate, where Hitler walked out when Jesse Owens was even put to the side. Marty Glickman, another a Jewish runner, was supposed to run and he was he lost the the opportunity to to win a medal. All of this to appease a dictator who was not in one way hiding what he was going to do. And for that small brief span of time, the world came together. And I think the Winter Olympics were in Berlin as uh, were in Germany as well. And and here, nothing. You know, it reminds me of what Elie Wiesel, Holocaust survivor, said: is that when he was asked what can the world learn from the Holocaust, he said that you can get away with it. And it seems at this point in time that China is following the same playbook. They're getting away with it. What do you, how, how would you they, respond to that? Well, they are. I just, I just think that we need to raise awareness as to how, uh, you know, uh, as to these atrocities. And again, you know, as you know, well, Charles, it took a long time. People didn't want to believe death, the Nazi death camps existed. I mean, the level of denial that most of us, you know, it's it's everybody, it's kind of human nature, you know, why rock the boat? Let's just stick with, you know, what's, uh, you know, whatever, you know, people have all sorts of reasons why they don't want to take tough choices. And it will be a tough choice to start disengaging from China. But as you say, when it's money, especially big money, it triumphs over principles. I do think that one of the things that's unique about the United States is we are big enough, powerful enough and have a powerful strain of liberty, justice, and freedom in our DNA, and of course in our constitution, that sometimes we do the right thing. And I think we are seeing a real consensus in, in Congress, and I think increasingly among the American people, uh, that we need to have a much tougher attitude towards China. It's like turning an aircraft carrier. You don't mm -hmm. do it on a dime. Uh, and uh, I think it's going to take you know, concerted action over many, many years, if not decades. Mm -hmm. This is, this is, this is a long struggle, but I, I think we can prevail. We have to okay. prevail. And people don't go out in the streets and demonstrate for more uh, autocracy. They don't go out and demonstrate in Red Square or Tiananmen Square right. saying, bring on the dictatorship. I mean, it just doesn't happen. People want freedom. Right. So, so Mark, you are president of the Committee for Freedom in Hong Kong. Tell me what that is and what you plan on well, it's obvious, right? You freedom for Hong Kong, freedom in Hong Kong, but uh, what 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 are you doing towards that end, and who is helping yeah, you? Well, thanks, uh, Charles. We were set up about a year ago, um, so we're less than a year old um, because our friends were in jail and our colleagues and just Hong Kong people, and we thought this is crazy. I mean, you go from this kind of uh, you know, I, you know, I don't want to over romanticize it, but you know, a very beautiful and free wheeling, free open city to one where people, you know, are just thrown in jail because 
you know, the communist overlords decide one day that they can and they don't like what they're doing. And whether they've been publishing a newspaper for 26 years or been in politics or whatever, they go in sometimes in the dead of night, drag people out, throw them in jail. And we thought we have to we have to try to do something about this. And so uh, we're very focused on political prisoners. We'd, of course, love to see them be released. I mean, that's our, our goal and and uh, released to be free in Hong Kong or to leave Hong Kong if that's what they want. Um, and uh, to do that, we are uh, waging an awareness campaign um, as well as legisl working with legislators for now in the US and UK, but I think over the next year in Europe and perhaps in, in Asia as well um, to try, because I think governments are the ones that are gonna have to make the choice. Getting back to the previous question, business can, you know, business is gonna do what business does. And uh, uh, I don't think that there's gonna be a lot of self-restraint on the part of businesses to not go into China or not be overly really reliant on China or to not, you know, sacrifice their, their ESG or human rights principles uh, to, for China. So I think we're gonna have to see government prohibitions on, on money and technology, and to some extent, ideas flowing in and out of China. I just don't see why we wanna support somebody that I think has as his ambition to, to rank up there with, with Hitler in terms of totalitarianism. I don't, I'm not suggesting he's planning to kill 6 million people, but China's done worse before. It yeah. wasn't so long ago that, yeah, I mean, Mao killed somewhere on the order of 50 million people yeah. through starvation and political campaigns. I mean, China is capable of this kind of totalitarian behavior and we've got to confront it. We've got to um, try to expose it for what it is. And we have to try to you know, starve the beast as it were of the, of the money and of the ideas and of the technology and even of the markets that it needs to, to keep growing. And it wants, it's, mm -hmm. yeah. And what, what about uh, your, the, your contacts now who are still in China? What is, how would they, what is the mood of the, of, I'm sorry, uh, in Hong Kong, what are the mood of the 7 million or so people in Hong Kong now? Well, I've got to be honest with you. I can't have too much direct uh, contact with them because I'd be putting them at risk. But uh, I think the feeling, the mood in general, as you know, so it's sort of a you know, couple steps removed is uh, it's well, they're weary, they're tired. They've been locked down for about two years by COVID. For COVID. And as you know, Hong Kong, like China, is pursuing this zero COVID policy, which means, you know, everything gets locked down. A couple of hamsters in a pet shop had yeah. Seem to maybe had COVID, so they killed all the hamsters. Now I see a couple of cats have them, you know. First they came for the hamsters, then they come for the cats. Next they're coming for me. I mean, I think that's sort of how people feel. Uh, it's So it's it's a very tough time. And I think it's it's hard in many cases to separate the national security law and the restrictions that have come with that and all the political arrests from the, the kind of lockdown that's come with COVID, which is, you know, a convenient excuse to, to you know, squeeze people. So uh, people are, you know, pretty tired right now, I think, and, and discouraged and demoralized. And have you been having success with going out and speaking to getting the word out there? Well, and I, Look, I think there's a great... Uh, receptivity and i think we've uh we've had some uh campaigns around the the olympics we showed these uh, these fantastic illuminations on a number of buildings uh beginning with the tower bridge in london chinese embassy in washington nbc at rockefeller center calling uh calling uh for the release of political prisoners for end to chinese uh repression and uh, for the sponsors and for NBC and, and the like to, to, to pull back. I can't say that we've had success in terms of uh, behavior changing, but we've had success in the fact that the ratings for the Olympics are, are at a record low. I Terrible. mean, nobody is watching them. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think the sponsors and, and NBC realize that, you know, you dance with a dictator and you're dancing with the devil. Yeah, no, it's just amazing. There's so many, uh, so many movements in this country on the liberal, liberal and progressive side, uh, on such what most people would call, you know, ridiculous uh, assumptions and concerns. But when it comes to real human rights, where where are these protests? Where 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 are the demonstrations? Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's something that um, we as a country need to grapple with, and, and why people. Uh, somehow think human rights aren't as important if it's if it's a Chinese or an Asian or somebody that's yeah. somewhere else. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, Mark, uh, the name of the book is Today Hong Kong, uh, Tomorrow the World, What China's Crackdown Reveals About Its Plans to End Freedom Everywhere. Uh, 
outstanding. All the success to you. And I really wish you the best. And, uh, you know, keep fighting the fight. It took it. it it's great to have a long term uh, game plan, not game plan, but long term horizon. But uh, the people in jail now are not they're not going to be able to uh, afford a law. They don't have a long term horizon. Yeah, well, sadly, uh, a number of very young people, most of the people who've been jailed um, are under 28. And so you've got a lot of teenagers, kids, even young boys and girls in some cases. Um, and uh, uh, they have a long fight ahead of them. Um, I'm um, just old enough to remember the Berlin Wall going up in 1961. Mm -hmm. I lived in Berlin for a uh, better part of a year in, in 1980, 81. And uh, I never thought I'd see the Berlin Wall go to come down. So uh, you have to have a long-term perspective when you're fighting a dictatorship. But, you know, I don't – autocracies, nothing ever lasts, and certainly not autocracies. And I think they're – I'm not predicting the imminent collapse of China. Far be it. Far, far from that. But there are many signs of internal weakness. And I think the fact that they're shutting themselves off and shutting themselves down – uh, from the rest of the world is is ultimately going to be very damaging from them. You if we can, for them, if we can uh, speed up that process, so much the better. Do you fear for your safety? Um, I'm in the States. I happened to be uh, uh, out of Hong Kong when uh, Jimmy was put in jail. And um, would you, let me ask you, do you, do you think you would have been put in jail? Well, there was a time when uh, I was the only director who was not, who was in Hong Kong and not in jail. Uh, I think the authorities are probably happy. I'm not. Um, I'm not there because arresting uh, an American uh, is is not something they like to do. But I'm not going to chance it and go back. So yeah, I guess I fear for my safety, but I'm not afraid because I'm in America. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. So the committee is uh, the committee is uh, the committee for the freedom in Hong Kong. Uh, I'll put a link to the website in the description. Uh, so if, uh, if listeners want to get in touch or just see what you're doing and, uh, um, you know, moral support and whatever they can do. Uh, but I, I th this book was chilling. This book was chilling because uh, if you could take a city as great as Hong Kong is and as prosperous is and destroy it literally overnight, uh, what won't the Chinese government do? That's uh, a great question, and I, unfortunately, we don't know the answer because under Xi Jinping and the wolf warrior diplomacy, um, it seems like nothing is off bounds for them. It seems like they have no shame. I mean, usually when a, an Olympic host country uh, comes up to the games, it sort of makes nice a little bit, releases a few political prisoners, pretends that it's on the road to reform. China doesn't even pretend no, anymore. No, even the Nazis, they took away all the signs that said Jews can't go into the parks and off the benches and started cleaning up some of the synagogues with the graffiti. But here it's, 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 it's front and center for the world to see. And the world is yawning. The world is yawning. So keep fighting the good fight and, and all the power to you. And I wish you the best well, thank you. and, uh, and yeah. uh, hopefully you'll prevail and prevail soon. Thank you, Charles. Really appreciate your interest. It's been great talking to you. Great. Thanks so much, Mark. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Charles Mizrahi show. If you're a new listener, welcome. If you've been listening for a while, we're glad to have you back. Either way, we'd love to know what you think of the show. Please leave a review if you listen on Apple Podcasts. Reviews make it easier for others to find the show. You can also see the video of the interview on the Charles Mizrahi Show channel on YouTube.